I'd like you to um, ask each other, ask your partner or, you know, in your little threes, um, what the other person wants to get out of today. Okay, I want you to have a listen to what they're going to say because you're going to tell me and you tell the rest of the group what that other person wants to get out of today. You three can do a little round robin if you like. Um, and I'm going to give you about two minutes to do that, which gives you just enough time to get some basic information and not get distracted by other things. So bunch up and go for it and I've got you on the clock. So Teresa, mm -hmm. what does Fiona want to get out of today? Please. She wants to be involved in some research. Yeah, but not sure of how to go about it as such. Yeah. Like she has, she has a bit of an understanding, but the right process and steps. Great. Is that right? Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Fiona, what's, ter uh, what's Teresa looking for? Teresa wants to be able to find uh, data. She wants to be able to find um, where, where to go to get this practice um, guidelines, data, just where to look on the internet because it's so big. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Alrighty. Okay, now, Helen, what does uh, Leone want? What's Leone looking for? Leone's looking for reasons why we do things. She said sometimes we do things without necessarily having that backup to say it's the right thing that we should do. Yep, yep. And, and she's got a curious mind. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Great. So, Leonie, what's is Simon wanting to get out of today? Inspiration. I love the word. Um, that we, we um, do research, but it seems really big and, and really cluttered, and to make it a little bit more simple. Okay. Sorry about the squeaky pen. bit more simple. It might not be quite right grammar, I apologise for that, but that's okay. Simon, what's Helen looking for? Um, so Helen's looking um, at options, I guess would be the best way to put it, um, for maybe a career path change or maybe a stopping of shift working, maybe less clinical work, more moving more into a researchy type. Yep position or something like that. Okay, so just starting to explore. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Now Gary, oh, good morning. Come on in, join the crew. I'm Kay. Karen. How are you Karen? Just pull up a pew. We're just, uh, we're just getting started. Um, you might have got the little gist of where we're going with this, Gary, but um, you missed out on talking to um, s someone else. But my question is for you is, what do you hope to get out of today? Great. Alrighty. Now, is your Gary a Gary with one R or two? Two R's. Two R's. Thanks. All right, and Karen, I'll, let, I'll just let you um, catch your breath just for the moment. Um, Karen and Gary, I've just got a pre-workshop question. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for me, that'd be lovely. Um, all right. Thanks for that. We'll add to that as people come. We're expecting some people from um, Ararat, so they might be a little bit late with the travel down. That's, I can, we can deal with that. That's good. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm happy about that. What I wanted to do was to perhaps introduce you to what we're going to do today and also introduce you to myself. Um, I call myself an accidental researcher because I never actually ever intended to do research. 
I'm a clinical nurse, that was my background. I was a hospital trained nurse. Um, I did my post-registration degree about five years after I did my course. I'm an ACU alumni and I went to ACU when it used to be in Ascot Vale and it's not there anymore, it's in Fitzroy now. Um, I avoided research at every opportunity. <laughs> I studied education, postgraduate. Uh, and I did it by coursework because research just scared the living daylights out of me. But what happened in 1999 was um, a colleague and I were asked to teach into a program that was run by the West Vic Division of General Practice. It was based in Ararat at the time and it was around telephone triage for rural nurses. And the first thing that you do when you teach a new program is you go and see where the evidence is. You go and look at the evidence, you find out what's going on and all of that sort of stuff. What's everyone done before? And what we discovered there was none. All there was back then was some very early um, information that was um, early trials of telephone triage lines in the UK. So it preempted the NHS Direct. Um, it, it well and truly preempted nurse on call or any any of that. So this there were some very preliminary um, studies that were being done in emergency departments in Australia to find out did people telephone hospitals, all of that sort of stuff. And there's a little bit of work from the US around telephone triage, but telephone triage in the US is quite different to Australia and the UK and much of Europe because it is a gateway to entering the, the healthcare system. So the way the private hospitals use telephone triage in the US is you must ring the telephone triage line to get permission to present. So it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quite different, it's quite different. So there, so there was no evidence around um, what rural nurses did and how they manage the calls, except for a couple of really early studies in the 1990s where the researchers, they were doing very preliminary stuff, some QA type studies, and there was one where basically one academic um, or uh, someone who was doing a study basically couldn't do it because every organisation said that they no one ever gave advice over the phone. And yet we actually knew <laughs> that, particularly in rural, a lot of communities did ring hospitals and nurses did provide care over the telephone. So what we did is we did the best we could with whatever evidence that we had. And so we had some evidence with triage, we had some evidence with telephone nursing, but again, really early before any of the, a lot of the telehealth, so it preempted telehealth stuff. And we had some um, work that was done around rural health and rural nursing and Desley Hegney's work was, um, um, you know, still uh, probably some of the most significant stuff at that point. And so we patched things together and tried to create an education program that, like that and I kept thinking, great, someone's going to do a research study and we'll find out what the information is. So we trolled around for about five years and no one did the research. So I went to the Professor of Nursing in um, Bendigo eventually and said, look, I've got an idea. I think I need to do some research because no one else is doing it. And um, Ruth Endicott uh, was her name. She's back in England now. She's a very wise woman. She said, that's a great idea, Kay. Excellent. Go away for 12 months and come back in a year. And if you're still interested, I'll have a chat to you. <laughs> okay, then. So off I went, trotted away, went away for a year, came back, knocked on her door. I'm still really keen. And that is what started the journey. So that was back in about um, 2006, and it took me seven and a half years to finish my study because I worked full time as well. So those years that I was coming here and teaching and you know that sort of stuff. Um, but I came at it from a point of no research background. I actually enrolled in a master's by research because my master's of education was by coursework, and then it, oh, it I was upgraded as part of that process. And I was very fortunate to have very good supervisors. So my journey into research is quite unconventional and I am the person who was probably least likely to end up in research. So I like to think that I'm actually not a bad advocate, particularly for clinicians, to start to look at research. And today we're going to look at research from a little bit of a different perspective. I guess it's a little bit like snorkelling. 
So we'll snorkel along the surface and we're going to look at some signposts. We'll look at a little bit of coral, a few little bits of things with the hope that you might grab something and think, oh, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper here and maybe go in and have another look. So this is very much an entry point because there's lots. It's this big and we've got about six hours, so we don't have much time. But I want to try and do it in a way that makes you feel like that perhaps at the end of the day that you've got something that you might be able to look towards and start to build on if you want to do some research. So that's where we're going to head today. No PowerPoint, just lots of discussion and stuff like that. So what I've got for you is some books and I've got different colours and I've purposely tried to choose colours that don't, um, that are different to the ones you might have in your, in your shelving. I looked at it when I was looking at the colours to choose, you know, the yellow was really pretty, but then I thought, oh, people think it's infection control and if I get a red folder, they'll think it's the emergency folder. And so if you don't like the colour you've got, you can always change and, you know, you can beat someone, you know, down and <laughs> grab the other colour if you don't like, you know, purple, blue or whatever. So just grab those. And the idea is, is hopefully you can... It, hopefully you can um, use this folder where you can start to add things to it as well. So it'll be something that you can build up on. One of my favourite saying is the one that's on the very front page by Albert Einstein. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? And I think that's a really important point. As clinicians, we're in a habit of thinking that we need to know everything before we start. And the thing with research is, and it's probably the biggest surprise, is, is you actually go into research not actually knowing what the answer is, and that's the hard part. Because we have that sense of, oh, I've got to jump to the conclusion, that I've, I've got to be there before I start. And so that's something that's probably the hardest thing as a clinician to start to sort of think about. So what we're going to do in session one is we're going to explore the idea of research, perhaps from a little bit of a different way and a little bit from uh, maybe some of the myths and um, misunderstandings that can come from helping us to, you know, when we're thinking about research based on the type of um, involvement we've had in the past. So I've got a few, I've got a list of myths and misunderstandings. They're just things that, um, that I've sort of probably just picked up along the way. We're not going to go through every single thing, but we're going to touch on a couple of them. And the first one is only high achievers and really smart people can do research. I can tell you now I'm a living example. If I had gone to university, I would never have got an honours degree because I was a D for Dunnett student. So I would have been completely, you know, overseen. It, it, I just wouldn't have been considered. Because to get into an honours degree, which fast tracks you into a PhD, you've got to do really well. And sometimes, particularly if you're young, that's, that's not when you're going to do your best work. And so there was a, um, a guy that uh, came and spoke to us when I was doing my studies. He was from the UK, I can't even think of his name now, but he was really interesting. And he said, doing a PhD is 10% brains and 90% persistence and he is so true. You've got to have grit and resilience uh, to be able to do research because it's it can sometimes be a bit challenging <laughs> and you've got to be able to be um, a lateral thinker and flexible and adaptable along the way and so clinicians actually have really good skills for that. They've got some really good basic skills for research. There shouldn't be any surprises when doing research. Oh my goodness, it's messy. Research is really messy for a start. You often look at research, I used to look at research and think, oh, it's really planned and we've got a really, and everything goes to plan and nothing's gonna go, you know, awry or anything like that. It's just like everything else, it's Murphy's Law. You start with the plan and then it goes sideways and so then you relook at what I need to do and that sort of stuff. The other thing too is research is all about the unexpected. So what I'll do today is I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the things that happened to me during my study as an example of, of um, 
what I what I learnt, and the thing that I learnt was what I what I thought I was studying, and what I came up with at the end was completely unexpected. So the title of my research was "What Actions Do Nurses Take When uh, People Telephone Victorian Rural Health Services with Unscheduled Healthcare Needs." It's very long, but it was very basic and grounded. So I thought I was studying what nurses did when they picked up the telephone. Yes, well, that was part of it. But what came out of that study was uh, policy practice gaps, behaviours of directors of nursing that were used protective mechanisms, who knew that the policy and the practices didn't fit, but they were too busy just trying to make things work and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And I redefined... The, what a rural nurse does. Now, I, I didn't think that that's what was going to come from that study. And that's the wonderful thing, is part of research is generating new knowledge, but you don't know what that's going to be yet when you start. And so if you think about curiosity and being inspira uh, inspired and all that sort of stuff, that's exactly what it's about. You start and you think, I have no idea where I'm going to go with this. And that's the exciting thing. That's the exciting part. Um, research studies need to be large to be worthwhile is a myth. It depends on the type of study that you're going to do. It's also, people sometimes think you've got to be in a big um, organisation, a big health service. I did all of my research in small rural health services, tiny, and it wasn't, that they weren't big, it wasn't a big study. The other myth is, is that random control trials are the best type of research. Oh, that's a bit controversial, isn't it? <laughs> and that's where we start to look at levels of research and we'll talk about that today. It's really important that you choose the type of research that suits the topic. So if you're going to do a, a study that looks at human behaviour in a realistic world situation, random <laughs> control trials are not the best type of research. <laughs> But if I want to know if a drug can work and if it has been tested and how has it been tested, that's important. But even then, for those of you that did some research in uni, the, the big thing was making sure you knew how to read, read a paper and to uh, crit, uh, critically look at how they found that research. In yesterday's workshop, one of the people in the workshop was a pharmacist and he talked about some of the drug trials, random controlled drug trials, of the drug companies that are conducted in third world countries because they're unethical and they can't get ethics approval in Western countries. And he said, the people that these drug trials are conducted on, he said, some of the results just don't apply and it's unethical as well. So we've got to learn to be critical about the evidence that we're looking at. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, point out was um, a myth that research will help fix a problem. And the important thing there is, is no, it won't fix a problem, it'll help you understand a problem, but what it's going to do is actually lift a few rocks and perhaps you'll find things you didn't want to find. <laughs> you've, been, you've been patting down going, you know, you ask, well, why is it that this happens or doesn't happen? Sometimes you don't actually, you know, once you start lifting those things and it might be, oh, hold on, did we really want it? And so when you look at quality assurance and stuff like that, you get a lot of the data and you go, oh, yes, well, we're doing this, we're ticking that box. In. But why are we doing this or not doing that? And that's where we start to lift some rocks. So sometimes it can create lots of, a lot more questions. All good research will get funded. No, it won't. <laughs> Sadly, it won't. It's, it's um, a, a hard thing. It's quite a process and we'll talk about that today. The other thing too is, another myth is research provides the truth about health. It provides a perspective. That's all it does, a perspective rather than a truth. And so, Teresa, when you're looking at evidence and you're starting to think about how like, this is really, it is, it's this big, it's starting to look at, well, how do I look at this and how do I um, critique this? The other thing too is it's better to do research on your own. 
this is one of those things where it's something that you need to do in a team. You need, it's really valuable to team up with um, a range of people and it's a partnership and collaboration as well and getting the right people in on that team to help you to be part of it. You don't have to be the expert. What you've got to be is really good at making sure you've got the right people with you so you can do it together. And it'll come back, um, we'll talk about this during the day about um, getting published and um, uh, disseminating your results and all of that sort of stuff. It's really valuable to uh, team up with someone who's already got a profile. And that's really important, particularly when you're a beginner. Make no mistake, there are three authors on my papers because I had two supervisors and my two supervisors worked damn hard <laughs> because they had spent seven years knocking me into shape and the number of times, you look at these papers that get published, you've got, you know, you might think, oh, that looks fair enough. You know, that's taken probably a year. So the latest paper that I had published came from my thesis. So that was, it took me a year just to write it, me and my long-suffering supervisors. So it takes a long time. So it's just something to sort of think about. So what I'd like you to do is flick over to the next page and I've, I've actually got a little continuum there and I've said, I've called it one way of thinking about involvement in health research. I've said one way because it's not a validated tool. It's not from, I just wrote it up as I was planning today, at planning the workshops to think, well, how can we look at how we might be involved in research? how you might be involved and how others that you know might be involved. So I wanted to start at ignorance. Unconscious and conscious ignorance. What do you think that might be in a clinician? I think someone starting out that has really no idea because they haven't learnt it or they haven't seen it. So they're ignorant of... Yeah, yeah. They, they might be starting out, they might have been in the profession for years and years and years. That's the other thing. So if you're unconsciously ignorant, you don't know that you don't know. You might be still, hopefully there's not too many left in the profession, certainly in nursing, but there, will, there are some clinicians that still practice by, through habit rather than evidence-based. And they've got no idea. They're just, you know, it's just like, I'll just do it that way. And that's unconscious. What about conscious ignorance? I'd rather do it my way because that's the way I've done it. Yeah, and the way I've always done it. Well, I know a good example of that. You know how we were taught to put the folds of the pillow slips away from the door? Yes. And that's to do with the, the Crimean War when the stand would come in through the tents and get into the pillow slips. Yep. So they used to turn them away and all the Florence Nightingale nurses were taught to do it that way and it was just a tradition that came down that that's the way you did it. And one of the, our nursing managers questioned me once and told me off. I said, well, where's the sand? You know, here at St John's. We were taught to do it because... When the director of nursing came in, they didn't see the open telecasts. And they go back and you take it back. That's really interesting, isn't it? I've never heard that. Yes. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Now, we saw a bit of, um, I certainly saw quite a bit of um, conscious ignorance when the national standards came out. Um, and that that need to, well you know that that won't work here we'll just we'll just I'll just stick or it's okay how long do we have to do this is bar thing oh it's all right just until accreditation and then we can go back to the way we normally you know that sort of stuff so yeah there is that that but the person is conscious of that that idea of the, there needs to be something different I think toileting is a really good example now. I've worked in nursing a long time. The concept of toileting and continence management has been around for a very long time. And yet, if we've still got people who say, oh, I don't believe that rubbish. You know, you take them to the toilet every two hours because that always works, you know, that sort of stuff. And so that's that sort of thinking. About. And you could probably recall or think about staff that you might have worked with that are that in that in that space. What about unconscious use? So we've got conscious use and unconscious use. What my, 
might be unconscious use of evidence. Yes. Yeah. So students are a really good example of that, where you will, you, they'll do the right thing, and then you'll ask them, "So why are you doing that?" And they'll go, "Because oh, that's what they showed me to." You know, that's what they, they they showed me to do. You know, this is how I was shown at uni. You know, that sort of stuff. So uh, I don't really know. I can reel off that it's evidence based practice, but I actually don't understand what that means. And so your conscious use again, is where when it's conscious, but you're thinking critically about it. So there's still a lot of staff who would say that they use evidence-based practice, but they don't actually understand what that means. And so if we're going to use it consciously, then we're very aware of, of where it is. And we're going to talk about evidence-based practice a, um, a little bit later as well. So what about contribution? How, how do people contribute to research, maybe consciously or unconsciously, especially in, the, in, in um, clinical practice? Leading forms, data, yes. audits. Yep, yep, yep. What are you doing? I don't know, I just have to fill in another form. You know, what's the better? I don't know, it's some stats for the, the government. You know, they want this. Um, uh, giving placebos is a, is a good example of unconscious. So you so you might have, you might very well be uh, consciously contributing. So um, you might have been asked to be part of a research study, and you might be a participant. That's certainly conscious contribution. Um, you know that sort of stuff. So what's the difference? Do you think about uh, contribution and generation? Oh, now we're starting to get up there. What's generation? It's contributing to the development. We're generating new knowledge, new ideas. And so where we can, we can actually be contributing to research or generating new ideas without actually being aware of it. Has anyone ever, say, done something new or done something in their practice and they've gone and presented at a conference? Now, what, sometimes what people don't realise is that they might have sparked up an idea and someone's gone to that conference and went, oh, I heard what the girls did at, you know, St, St John's or the girls and guys. And that was a great idea and I'm going to take it back and do, do that. We're going to apply that. Now, you may have contributed or generated some new ideas and you're not even aware of it. And that's really, that's, that's a really interesting. Because so the other thing too is even though it may not be published in a, in a journal, you might have done a project, you've written the report, the report's out there, someone's taken that report, they've taken the recommendations from the report, so the recommendations might be some level of contribution in some way or some generating some new ideas, and then they get adopted, but in a very quiet way. And I think in health, sometimes we, we're a little bit too quiet about some of the things that we do. What about fostering? What do you think about fostering? What's fostering about when you're looking at research? I mean, we're taking more of an active role and uh, being more part of the research, I guess. And encouraging. Yeah. Developing Enca an idea further or...? Oh, even fostering. Fostering ideas, um, if it's, but predominantly of others too, encouraging others. So you don't have to be a researcher to, to foster others to research. Encouraging junior staff coming through to to um, pursue ideas and things can be fostering. Or you might be, I'd like to think that maybe these workshops are about fostering with a little bit of, with a little bit of luck. A bit of mentoring, helping, that sort of stuff. Even working with students and encouraging them to make links between theory and practice is fostering evidence-based practice and research. And that's important too. And so sometimes we don't even think about the, the ways we work with research in an everyday context. And leading is where you have your senior researchers, your senior career researchers, your um, head of researchers, you know, the ones that drive the research agenda, that sort of stuff. So I started research in the third trimester of my career, so I've got white hair and I'm an early career researcher, <laughs> which is really much, very much about being at the beginning 
I don't think I'm ever going to get to that top one. You've got to be in it for a few years. I don't think I'll have enough time. Does that, where do you think you are? Where, where would you peg yourselves if you were looking at that continuum right now? Where would you see yourself, Teresa, in your role? Maybe a conscious contributor. Yep, yep, yep. Looking at sort of because you're drawing on lots of different policies and yep. I'm looking at yes. all the um, documentation that we use and so. Yeah. You know, like that, I have to. Yeah. Be across a little bit more yeah. than anybody else and look at what's out there. Yeah. yeah. Where would you put yourself, Simon? I think I, it, um, it changes, I think. But probably somewhere from um, being a contrib contributor to fostering. Yep. Um, not so much with research, but the understanding of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that depends, sort of in that spectrum, I'd yeah. say. And it's how we define research and how we think about research. So that's the other thing, is broaden the way you think about research a little bit too. It's, it's not all just the really the, the formal sort of that one thing. All right. So what I'd like you to do is, now that we've got a few more people, that's good but we've still got odd numbers so there's a there's a tragedy but that's okay we can deal with that that'll be all right so what I'd like you to do for the next couple of minutes is um, on page four there's a table and there is one side that says what might you know so I've said here what might you, what might you know I've said we're looking at knowing about rural and regional health <coughs> and particularly um, what might you know about health in a regional region like uh, Ballarat, but also um, working in a private health facility as well? I'd like you to spend two minutes just jotting down as many ideas that you can think of, of what you might know about rural or regional health. What might you know? Two minutes. Go for it. Just don't overthink it. Just two minutes. What might you know? So what I'd like you to do is spend a couple of minutes uh, thinking about what you might know about your particular area of practice or workplace. So spend just, get a timer, spend two minutes thinking about what you might know. It could be anything. Then when you've done that, take another two minutes and jot down how you might know that. So what are all the things that um, you know and where you've got that knowing from and see how you go and well, you can have a listen to what everyone else has said and see where you fit with, um, with the group. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now that you've done that side is I would like you to spend um, a minute writing down between how might you know this? How might you know this? All the things that you thought that, that you think I might know, how might you know that? So, Gary and Teresa, what's two things that you thought you might know about rural or regional health or something? Yeah, tra it's very traditional. Traditional? Mm. Yep. So it's very traditional. Is that like old habits die hard? Is yeah, we've always done it that way. Always yeah. done it that way, yeah. And one other thing? I'm less specialised. Less specialised? What we meant by that is we've got a medical ward here that covers everything. Yes. Whereas if you're at the Royal Melbourne, yes. you have a, um, a, <coughs> a ward for every. So the nurses are quite broad in their skills. Yes. So um, our clinicians, um, whether they're working in nursing, allied health, medicine, they need a broad skill base, don't they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> two things that you guys came up with, Fiona and Helen, what were two things that you thought you might know? I've worked at both in Skipton and I just said thank God I wasn't even that man presented with the chainsaw through his face. Right. Because that's what you felt every time you worked. You had your workload within the hospital, but you never knew. You had your AMIs, you had everything coming. So as a, 
a young grad in those days, it was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to depend on that senior nurse. And their wealth which was just astounding. Yeah. And no GP after five. Yes. So that's really important, isn't it? So there's the, um, the unexpected that, that turns up and that is high acuity quite often. And this is where urban-based um, clinicians don't understand. Just because we don't have the resources doesn't mean the people don't turn up. They still come. We've yep. to that community about their expectations on that health service, but so unrealistic. Yeah. So unexpected presentations. We've got uh, community expectations. Yep. And there was one other thing you said in there, Fiona, that I wanted to capture, and that was the more senior staff had the skills the and yeah. the knowledge, and there was something else, and I can't... Um, after hours, or... GPs? That's right. No, GPs, no, GPs, yeah. Years ago, your GP lived in the back, and Dr. Little would bring him, he'd deliver at 10 o'clock at night, he'd search up something at 3 a.m. in the morning, and then got caught up in the bailer. But now, it's tri-star. Yep. They don't live in a town, they just go nine to five out to that region. They're just not available after hours anymore. Yeah. And that, for some towns, that'll be in hours and out of hours as well, yes. Um, in the, for the last 20 years, the two areas, clinical areas or two health service areas I've worked in is um, rural and private. And there are a lot of similarities because of the lack of the, the residents and the, red, you know, the junior doctors being available. And I look at the role of the nurse in a private hospital and the role of the nurse in a rural hospital, there's a lot of alignment there. And it's quite interesting, I think. Yeah. Thanks for that. Okay, Karen, Simon and Leonie, what did you, what were two things that you came up with that you might know about? Um. Quite a few, but to choose two off the list, so it says that there's maybe a difference in morbidity and mortality. Yeah. In the rural areas. And we were talking about um, maybe the difference between someone who lives out of town on a farm seeking health care compared to someone who works in a suit in an office in Melbourne or Sydney or wherever. Um, seeking health care, their needs would probably not be the same. Yeah. Um, or the reason that they would present would probably not be the same. Okay, so we've got different morbidity and mortality, but also different health seeking behaviours, I think, is what I'm hearing. Yep. Yeah, different. Uh, different yeah, so there's a lot of. Different expectations of the yes. consumer. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and the definition of a consumer in a rural setting and even regional setting is quite different to urban. So the difficulty with the um, national standards and accreditation is the way they define a consumer. And so it actually doesn't really fit rural because uh, I had an interesting discussion with an accreditor a couple of years ago um, because I work regularly with two small rural health services, so I meet with the accreditors and do the education stuff um, for the accreditors, and we're talking about standard number two and partnering with the consumer. And um, in rural, in a small rural town, your consumer is the whole community, <laughs> and they sort of own you anyway. And uh, the accreditor did not recognise that. And they said, no, a consumer is only the person who uses your health service. Mm. And it was really interesting because the other thing too is a lot of the health service staff are also consumers and they're considered, it's actually on the facts uh, question set on the accreditation that a staff member is not considered a valid person to interview as a consumer. But it doesn't recognise that in small rural towns a lot of your consumers are also staff who may not be clinical staff and who have a very unique perspective on on the service, which I think is really important. And has anyone got anything else that they really wanted to add to that, that, that we don't have anything burning? And we put that we knew all the stakeholders. Yes. And it's, um, 
he would ask us which nursing home would you pick or which hospital would you go to, which doctor would you go to. We seen everyone has their own opinion and they know exactly, whereas in Melbourne you wouldn't know. Yes. And especially we know every doctor in the hospital. Yes, yeah, so knowing the staff um, and selection of services is a, perhaps not, yeah, based, it might be based on personality and who works where and all that sort of stuff. Okay, thanks. So knowing the stakeholders. Have you guys got... Um, um, I also thought that there's quite, quite limited on our service provision. Yes. And for example, with our um, maternity background, if we have a very unwell baby, it has to go to Melbourne because we can't care for it here. Yeah, limited service provision and what we can manage and cope with. Yeah. Have you three got one? Uh, anything else you wanted to add? We've got, which sort of talks to some of those, is about high visibility of service providers. In yes. Um, oh, I'm getting scrappy now. Um, that leads into the lack of anonymity and um, the dual relationships that we have, isn't it? That, that high visibility. You talk to any rural nurse, and you may even find this here in Ballarat, if someone sees you down the street, they, uh, they, they look for a consultation in the, uh, in the supermarket aisle. And that's a well-known phenomenon. So. so my question is, for those of you that are watching, is how did that list um, compare to yours? And, and have you found similar things? Or are there some other things that we haven't talked about yet? So I think that's really important. So how did you know this? Or how might you know this? Leonie, how might you know the things that you came up with? Uh, I think you probably grow up knowing it, but it's talking to people mainly and, and listening more importantly. Talking and listening to people and growing up with it. What does that mean? Just. Uh, if you're born in a country area and you don't move too far away, then you you know your own family and you know yes the, you know the score right from the start. You do, you do, yeah. and, and related I'm, to everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I related to everyone. Yeah, and that's quite unique, isn't it? As a health professional, is not only might you be related to the patients or the residents, or the clients, you may be related to the staff that you, that you're looking after. Um, and as managers and as nurses and all that, that can be confronting sometimes. So you might be someone's, you may have been someone's midwife and I have several examples of staff who, who manage their own midwife and I'm not talking the person who helped them have a baby, I'm talking the person who caught them as a baby. And so that's quite unique, quite unique. But it gives you that contextual insight, doesn't it, into what different things... You look at um, some of your um, health-seeking behaviours, it feeds into some of that knowledge of that context and of that community. How might you two have known some of the things that you came up with? We threw the media into the mix. Media? Yeah. 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 Oh like, it, you know, uh, ambulance delays and closure of, that, closure of services and yes. things like that that they... Probably around election time too, you hear a lot of negative. Yes. Yeah. You don't hear a lot of positive stuff, it's always about closures. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so, so that mix of media and uh, politicising uh, healthcare gives you some, some ideas. Okay. How might you two have known some of the things that you came up with? What did you come up with? How might time you? in the workforce and our experience in the workforce. Ah, yep. So, time. In your workforce, experience, time in the workforce and experience. Who else might you know some of this stuff? I put diversity of roles. Diversity of roles? Yep. Because in a small service we often find that nurses work across a diversity of areas. And yeah. They migrate from one to another. So it's part of that experience, isn't it, as they gather. Who else might you know things? You read the AMF journal. You've read journals. So you read? <laughs> you do. The literature? What's in the literature? This is where we talked about some research that's been done into rural health. Yes, research. That's how we know. So we know things through different ways. And I think what's really important is, is that we that we are cognizant that 
um, that knowing that we have is founded in a range of things. And particularly, as you said, Leone, listening and talking. Lived experience is an important way of knowing, but also that balance of doing some reading and finding out, that sort of stuff. There's a great quote that I've got at the bottom here on this page, and I think this is really important. It was from the Rural Health Symposium in 2014. Some of the most important and valuable rural and remote health research is undertaken locally for practical purposes. And I think that's really valuable because it leads into a lot of the, I, I suppose, my perspective that I have from evidence-based practice. But when I was looking at this and planning this day, I was sort of looking around to think, well, okay, we've been doing a lot of research in rural health. There's been really good research over the last 30 years in rural health. There's a lot of research in urban but how much research is in regional health and private health? Because private health is a unique environment as well. And um, if you look at some of the regional health services where they're, they're not urban, but they sort of are, but they're not, but they've got responsibilities of the rural areas, you look at Ballarat Health Service, what, are the, what makes that unique? They're urban, but they're not you know, that sort of stuff. And so there's a lot of things that perhaps we don't know. And that's the other thing to think about is if we look at, if you flick over to the next page, I've given you a list of some of the key things that are known in rural and remote research that's been demonstrated in Australian and international literature. And if you read that list, it's interesting, we've got quite a few of those things reflected in people's lived experience. Because that's where a lot of research comes from. A lot of research comes from people's lived experience and finding out about that. Which leads me to the idea of evidence-based practice. And I think this is probably the most important part, uh, the, the thing to think about mostly today is what is evidence-based practice? I've, I've used this definition because, look, it's a, a, a fairly, if you look at a lot of definitions of evidence-based practice, they all sort of come back to the very similar sort of um, uh, description or basis. And this is a nice general one, I thought. It's an international um, descri description or definition. Evidence-based practice is applying the best available research. Take note, best available research is what is evidence. Doesn't say must be a random control trial. <laughs> Does not say level one only research. It says best available. When making decisions about um, healthcare, healthcare professionals who perform evidence-based practice use research evidence along with clinical expertise and patient preference. My question is, what is your thoughts about that definition? When I look at the first bit, I think of the university lecturer that's marking your essay that you've written and how it's all what they think of it, what, um, you know, you sort of write your paper for the person rather than for the topic. So if you're looking for the best available research, then you're going to be a little bit skewed in what, because you, you're looking for what you think you should be looking for rather than... Yeah. Now, um, so, so looking at when you're writing an assignment for your essay for your lecturer, that's actually in part research training. So what happens is, is, is when you're writing essays for your lecturer, the requirement is for you to go and find the best available evidence that you can. So what it's trying to train you to do is to support your, your thinking, that's right. So it's grounded in evidence rather than just, um, I've just made that up, yeah. yes. That's a really interesting process <laughs> when you first do it. Because I remember thinking, oh my goodness, 
Can't I have an idea for myself? No. <laughs> Answer. But I can tell you now, when you've been doing that for years and then someone says, oh yeah, go cut loose and come up with your own ideas around what you've done in research, that's even scarier. Do you think, oh, hold on, who's looking over my shoulder? But I didn't think I was allowed to come up with an original idea because I haven't. And that's, what that is, is about helping you to draw on that evidence. It doesn't feel necessarily feel like that at that time. But you, what you're trying to do is, is get best evidence. And I don't know about you, but when I first started um, writing academically because I had no idea. I got everything back, you know, sweeping statements, not enough references. Oh, for goodness sake, you know, what do they want for nothing? Because I had never had to reference anything when I was training as a hospital trained nurse. I just regurgitated what we were taught in an exam because we didn't do essays or anything like that. So it was quite foreign. It was a different way of thinking. So. Teresa, you work in, um, uh, in risk and in accreditation and we look at a lot of our systems that are based on evidence-based research. Where, does, where do you see, uh, added, there's three components in that definition. Best available research, the um, clinical expertise and patient preference. Which of those three in a hospital accreditation system is probably takes priority. Patient preference. Um, they, the creditors look at it from a consumer's perspective, so that's where I'm thinking patient yep. preference. But I think they're still looking at um, the, the best practice because the standards are meant to be best practice. Yeah, so my question is, is, is there any tension between best practice and patient preference and clinical expertise? Yeah, where do you see that tension? Everyone's an individual, so you can't, one size doesn't fit all. One size yeah. does not fit all, that's exactly one right. Form to fit every person. That's it? We've well, got lots of tick boxes and things like that? Yeah. Fiona, what are some of the, have you got an example of something maybe might be a best, best uh, evidence-based practice uh, strategy that we use in health that might create tension with patient preference and or, and or clinical expertise? Yeah, I suppose we've got a good example recently. We've got, um, we're trying to develop our HIS board and we've got patients that are required to be seen by a doctor every week. Yeah. A lot of them live, you know, 30, 40 k's away and are unable to Ah. So what do we do? Yes. Because they don't want to. So now we've suggested that the um, district nurse or the nursing service do it, take out their phone and do like a phone consult on FaceTime yeah. or yeah. Skype. Yep. Yeah. So, so the best practice is uh, under this model, they come in, have their procedure, go home early. They, they're required to see the doctor every every week, yeah. but because of distance and all of that sort of stuff. We, no, I will not come back. Yes. So yeah. What do you do? Yeah. You've got to adapt, don't you? you do, yeah. You that's right. Yeah. 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 That's good because because but what you're doing is you're adapting. I, I think an interesting one is um oh bedside handover. Ah now what's really interesting there is best practice bedside handover. Are all the clinicians happy with that? No. Are all the patients happy with that? No. Do we know why? woken up. Mm. Mm. They don't like that. And we don't like waking them up. Yeah. Sleep's important. That's right. So my question is, is where do we go when we want to try and find a balance? Because sometimes, um, we've talked about this uh, previously, is um, someone, people often say, oh well, you know, bed's hand handover. Well, it's just communication. People aren't communicating well enough. Well, they may or may not be. Or, you know, if the, if the patient really understood what it was about, they'd want to be involved. Well, maybe or maybe not. But do we, the, the risk with evidence-based practice is perhaps the way sometimes we apply it. And it's a very, um, uh, it, it can be a little bit solicitous in that if we look at uh, uh, best available evidence, we think best practice, 
So that's the way it needs to be. So we'll build our system on best practice and we'll put a few tick boxes next to it and that is how it will work here without actually thinking about what are the contextual issues that we might have to, to deal with in this, in this situation. So evidence-based practice has its benefits but it also has limitations. Because remember, it's best available evidence. What if there isn't great evidence available? If there's something that you do and you look at the best practice guidelines and you think, hmm, there's something that's not quite right here. One of the questions in your pre-workshop questionnaire was, are there some things, best practice guidelines, that, you, that sometimes don't seem to fit as all that well in your area, in your context? It's looking at, well, this is best practice, but how do we fit? And how do we find out um, where it fits best and how it works in different contexts? So a lot of research that, we, that is really useful to do is look at how things work and why in different situations. Does that make sense? Would it be fair to say as well that organisations get, um, and individuals as well, get caught up in that best practice, policy, procedure, whatever that form, tick box is, whereby you can't do it any other way. Yes. And you've got to fit into that mould and it causes a lot of tension. It does. So getting caught up in that policy protocol, there's only one way to go. What you need to remember is they are best practice guidelines. <laughs> I always go by um, the guidelines, policies, best practices for the obedience of rules, but the guidance of the why. Yes. Um, the difficulty though, and probably it's different in different disciplines, but some disciplines look at these and think they are rules. Hmm. And that's the difference. So my question is, is when you look at guidelines or rules, for those of you beaming in, do you use best practice guidelines as guidelines or as rules and routines? So when a, one of the rural hospitals are, that, I, um, that I work in, when we first started with national standards, there's the book, there's the guide, and it has suggestions for how you might demonstrate these. They were working through that like a tick box, like, oh, yes, we do that. Oh, we don't do this yet. We don't do that, you know, that sort of stuff. So they were, they were seeing it as a set of rules rather than guidelines. And so where there are some really interesting things to explore is where policy and practice don't meet. And that's an area that I'm really interested in because that was an area for, for me that it was, we were so busy, we had policies that said, um, no, no one gives advice over the phone in this organisation, but everyone knew that the locals rang the hospital and you gave advice or care. But, and so did the director of nursing. The director of nursing knew, but the director of nursing would say, oh, well, we're just pretending it's not happening. Because, uh, and we want to give them, because we don't upset the doctor or do something, you know, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then we end up with problems all over the place. And what sometimes happens is, is we have a formal process, uh, but the formal process doesn't work. So we've got all the unwritten ground rules and this is how, this is the way it says we're going to do it in the policy, but this is the way it's actually done. Now, where I'm interested in is what's the difference and why if, there, if we're working outside of policy, for me, that's a trigger to say, oh, maybe we need to revisit what we're doing. Because there is no point in having evidence-based guidelines guiding our practice if none of us are following it because it won't protect anyone, make no mistake, even in a court of law. So yesterday we had a discussion about box ticking. So we're talking about mm, something, documentation, I don't know, it was something. And a couple of the girls were talking about how they felt that it might have been clinical pathways or something like that. They were ticking the boxes but weren't thinking about but then as I said to them, that's an assumption that they're, that they're not thinking. How do you know they're not thinking? Maybe that's what we need to find more about. So it's opening some of those things up. Have you done policies for, for a year? Because we have this thing where people call us because we're midwives um, for advice after they go home. Yes. 
and we've got checklists that we you know you have yep. to ask them questions so yes. it's not just a labor thing it's an after they've gone home yep. with their baby yes and i'm thinking that what we're doing is probably like what you're doing is generating and contributing to practice and what you want to do is maybe harness that if it's not formalized that's a great thing to look at yeah, so there you go. There's a great... Because yeah, part of it... Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Like but part of it might be looking at... Is, is, that, is that appropriate? Is it adequate for what you're doing? Those sort of things. Mm. So what I'd like you to do over morning tea is start to think about what are some of the things that you might not know about your area of practice? Where are you wise? As in um, W H why as in rather than our wise um, where are your questions what are the things that the, the things that you're thinking about that you don't understand fully or something doesn't quite add up because we're going to work with that in the next session so what I'd like for those of you that are beaming in is to think about that too is is what are your whys around your area of practice and then we're going to in the next session we're going to start to explore some of those and unpack them using the research process. So let's stop and, and have a break. Be good, thanks.